So for those that don't know me, I'm John Mufler and I'm the Executive Director of Community Employers WA. Hopefully you can all hear me. Thank you for uh, muting your mics. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land that you're joining this online forum from, and in my case, the Wadjuk people of the Noongar Nation, and to pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. I wish to acknowledge and respect their continuing culture and the contribution they make to the lives of us all. On behalf of WACOS and CIWA, uh, welcome to this online forum. Uh, on the COVID-19 vaccines and the issues to consider for employers and employees in the not-for-profit sector. We know this is a, an important topic for you, for your boards, for your staff, for your employees, for the work, for the people you work with, um, and certainly um, those that you support. We also know that the rollout of the vaccine is underway across Australia. Uh, in WA, we've had the recent opening of a couple of large vaccine sites in Perth, and this week, uh, access to receiving the vaccine through a number of GP clinics has started for people over the age of 50. And I'm pleased to say I booked in for this Sunday morning. Uh, so with, with the context that I've set out, um, CIRA and WACOS thought it'd be good to share the not -for -profits, with the not-for-profit sector the key legal issues to consider and to provide an opportunity for you to ask questions on legal, medical and ethical issues in relation to your workplaces, your employees and the people you support. Before I introduce the presenters, a couple of suggestions with regards to Zoom. Um, we recommend that you use presenter view, which in the top right hand corner of your screen, you should be able to see uh, nine dots in a box with view and you can select the type of view. Um, that'll be a little less distracting from the number of people that are joining us. Um, I think most of you have already muted your microphone, so please keep your microphone muted uh, unless you're going to ask a question. Um, thank you for those that have put their camera on. It's great to see people um, that uses some of the visual connection. So if you're comfortable in putting a camera on, um, it'd be, uh, be much appreciated. Um, you're welcome to type questions into the chat through the presentation, if you like, and we can come to those uh, at the end. Um, and we'll also, as I said earlier, have an opportunity to ask questions. So you'll just unmute at the time, you know, put your hand up or use one of those little reactions down the bottom and we'll try and get through as many questions as we can. Um, Helen's going to present a PowerPoint um, presentation shortly. We'll send that out to everybody. So don't worry about having to take photos of it or write down every word that's on there. We'll do that. We're also recording it. So you might see in the top left-hand corner, there's a, a little recording signal. Um, and so that'll become available in due course as well. So I'd like to now introduce our key presenter and our special guest speaker. Firstly, Helen Beach. Helen is special counsel at Kingston Reed, um, which is Australia's largest specialist workplace law firm. The area of mandating vaccines for employees is a topic of particular interest to both Helen and the firm. And they've written uh, a couple of really good articles uh, on this, which you can find on their website. I was looking at them yesterday. You just have to Google Kingston Reed and in the tabs at the top, you'll see um, some resources and, and you can click on those and, uh, and share those with your, with your colleagues or boards or others. Helen's uh, expertise is in employment and industrial relations law, um, in enterprise bargaining agreements and in fair work commission matters and the courts. We try and avoid the courts, but sometimes it gets to that stage, unfortunately. Her clients cover a wide spectrum, including corporates, commercial government and the not-for-profit sector. So welcome Helen and thanks for joining us. And to our uh, special guest, uh, really pleased, Norman, that you're able to join us this morning. Norman is a, a physician and journalist. He's been on ABC Radio National Health Report since 1982. Um, Norman's a co-founder of Tonic Media Network, and I understand is about to publish your first book, Norman, as well. Um, more broadly, the two areas that Norman's best known for are the Daily Corona Cast on the ABC where yesterday they presented, uh, Norman and Tegan Taylor presented their 300th episode since the start of the pandemic. 
His research and knowledge on coronavirus and his ability to articulate the key issues is, is exceptional and widely lauded. And the second uh, fun fact, if you like, about Norman is it is the dad of Jonathan Swan, who famously interviewed President Donald Trump last August in what many say is one of the most outstanding interviews of the former president that they've ever watched. So if you haven't seen it, I strongly encourage you to watch that on YouTube and can only imagine it would have been a very proud dad moment in, uh, in watching that, Norman. So thank you again, Norman, for joining us and, uh, and we'll, we'll come to you after Helen's presentation. So with that, Helen's going to share her screen and uh, over to you, Helen. Thanks so much. John, um, and thanks so much, Bjorn, really, for having um, me come to speak here today. This is such a dynamic and interesting area of the law, and I'm really thrilled to be able to have some time to discuss it with everyone here today. Um, but thank you, John, also for arranging Norman to be here. I'm um, thrilled, and it's an honour to be speaking um, with you, Norman. And I think the pairing um, of having you along here today is just wonderful because the question we're here to discuss really about the ability at law for employers to require their employees to be vaccinated really as a condition of their ongoing employment is answered in many ways um, with answers to questions of a medical and scientific nature. So I think having you here to provide your expertise is invaluable and is going to make for a great discussion today. So um, thank you also for coming as well. I'll share my screen then everybody and we'll get started and I'm hoping to, to run through the presentation and then towards the end, um, Norman, it would be great to have your input um, onto some of the points that, that we are discussing and hopefully we can have a, an interesting discussion coming out of those points together. So let's kick off then. Here we go. So go, go to the beginning. Um, COVID-19 vaccination in the workplace. This is a bit of a summary of the things I wanted to discuss um, with everybody here today. Firstly, why is the COVID-19 vaccination an important workplace issue and important from an employment law perspective? I think we all appreciate that it's important from a public policy and a public health perspective, but why should we be interested in it as employers and employment practitioners? Um, then I'll explain the legal test which applies to the question of whether an employer can lawfully require their employees to get a vaccination. And we'll explore that test by what we know from the existing case law, which exists already in relation to the flu vaccine. Um, we'll then um, have a discussion about applying that law to the COVID vaccine right now and hopefully get to the bottom to the extent we can with some clarity about the position of employers in Australia, in Western Australia, right now to require their employees to be vaccinated against COVID-19. And I'll conclude then with some um, steps that you can go away and take to your desks at the end of the call, um, just to put your operations in the best position possible um, going forward with relation to managing the COVID vaccination at your workplace. So with that in mind, um, why is the COVID-19 vaccination a workplace issue? Um, and really the answer to that is evident, no doubt to many of you already from the experiences we've had of COVID so far and the lockdowns we've experienced as part of that. I imagine that the pandemic and its lockdowns have caused for many of you already operational issues, particularly in relation to filling rosters and maintain, maintaining client service levels. This will get worse, I imagine, when we find ourselves in a situation where some of your employees are vaccinated for COVID and others aren't. Those sorts of issues could be exacerbated again um, if we think about the ability, and I, I imagine this happens, of your clients and perhaps their family members making specific requests for particular caregivers to provide care to their family members or for specific um, people to be vaccinated in order to provide care to their family members and, and to your clients. And I imagine that will be a particularly difficult um, service delivery outcome for you to meet in the context, again, when only some of your employees are vaccinated and others aren't. Many of you would already also have had to navigate the complexities of NDIS and other funding restrictions which apply when rostering doesn't go smoothly and you need to draw on um, alternative labour sources. 
And finally, COVID-19, I think, is really more of a problem for the employers on this call, almost more than any other category of employer. And that's because the inherent requirements of the roles of many of your employees involve the provision of face-to-face, -face, close contact personal services. Uh, the transfer of COVID between employees and from employees to clients is more of an issue for those of you in these sorts of industries than in many other industries for this reason. And if COVID spreads throughout one of your facilities, the consequences can be dire from a business, operational and reputational perspective, not to mention the health and lives of the people affected. So those are all really good practical business reasons why COVID-19 and the vaccination against COVID-19 matters at your workplace. But those aren't the only reasons why you need to be concerned about this from an employment law perspective. Perhaps the overarching reason why the COVID-19 vaccination is important from a workplace law perspective are employers overriding occupational health and safety obligations. Here in Western Australia, right now, that's governed by the Western Australian Occupational Safety and Health Act. And broadly speaking, that act requires employers to provide a working environment for their employees, which is free of hazards and requires employers to not adversely affect the health of other people at the workplace. The OSH Act also requires employees to take reasonable care of their own health and safety at work and to avoid adversely affecting the health of any other person at the workplace. And this means that the OSH Act places a positive obligation on employers to make sure, so far as is practicable or reasonably practicable in the forthcoming legislation, that employees do not catch COVID at work and that they do not give COVID to co-workers or clients at work. This means that employers need to consider their approach to the COVID vaccine as part of complying with their obligations under the, health, under the OSH Act. And so these legal obligations to ensure safety at work, combined with the practical considerations we've just discussed, really bring this home as an important issue for employers in these industries to address. So what can you do about it? What are an employer's rights in this regard. This is the test. Employers can direct their employees to be vaccinated against COVID-19 if the direction is, and these are the words that are important, lawful and reasonable. What does that mean? This means that if a direction to be vaccinated is both lawful and reasonable, an employee must comply with that direction. If the employee does not comply with that direction in circumstances where it is unreasonable to do so, the employee will be in breach of their contract of employment for failing to follow the lawful and reasonable direction. And this would give, right, uh, give rise to, to the right of an employer to take disciplinary action against the employee for engaging in that breach of contract by failing to comply with a lawful and reasonable direction. So the question is, when will a direction to vaccinate for COVID-19 be a lawful and reasonable direction such that you as employers can take disciplinary action in relation to an employee who refuses to get vaccinated? So there's two words there, lawful and reasonable. The lawful part's the easy one. We'll deal with that quickly. It essentially means that the direction must be within the scope of the employee's employment relationship and not illegal. That box gets a tick here. Um, a direction to vaccinate for COVID-19 in the current circumstances as we understand it in Western Australia will be lawful, so that's fine. The real question and the real tricky one that we're going to spend the rest of today discussing is would such a direction be reasonable? Courts address this question of when will a direction be reasonable by looking at a number of relevant factors and balancing up those factors which tend towards a conclusion that the direction is reasonable against those which tend to support a conclusion that the direction was unreasonable. And whichever is the weightier of the two is the outcome as to whether or not the direction is reasonable. 
And I've listed these categories of, of criteria, I guess, on the slide here. But broadly, they involve an analysis of the precise duties of the employee, the nature of the workplace that that employee works in, and an analysis of the documents which govern the employment relationship. A court or tribunal will also look at the legal obligations which exist in relation to the employer and the employee. For example, the OSH Act obligations I've just touched on, whether any government directives exist, what the expectations of the community are, and other practical considerations in the context of, of a vaccination discussion. So that's a lot to take in. And because this is an emerging and brand new area of the law, there are unfortunately as yet no super duper helpful cases that exactly tell us the answer and how the courts will apply this test in the context of the COVID-19 vaccination. Helpfully, however, there are four cases just from uh, this year and one late last year, so four really recent cases that deal with this exact question in the context of the flu vaccine. So I think it's helpful for us to look quickly at those cases because they provide colour and illustration to how the courts apply this question of what is a reasonable direction in the context of a vaccination. This is the first case. It is a childcare involved, uh, employee employed at a childcare centre and the employer introduced a new policy that made flu vaccines mandatory. The employee refused to get one and she was dismissed. Now the case wasn't decided on this issue because the applicant filed her application out of time. And so the decision was largely about the, the, the out of timeness, if you will, of the application. Uh, but in any event, the commissioner made some comments about the reasonableness of vaccine directions. Um, and she said, um, in her view, the employer's mandatory flu vaccination policy was arguably lawful and reasonable in the context of the employee in this case, needing to care for young children who were too young to be vaccinated. So this case makes the point that because the duties of the employee in question involved providing face-to-face -face close contact care to vulnerable clients, in this case, young children, the employer's mandatory flu vaccination policy was arguably lawful and reasonable. So that's a good start. Second case, this is an aged care home case. Again, the Commission didn't exactly decide this case on the question of a lawful and reasonable direction. It was concerned with a preliminary jurisdictional issue. But nonetheless, the Commissioner um, helpfully saw fit to make a number of comments about the lawfulness of um, requiring employees to have vaccinations as a condition of their ongoing employment. And the Commissioner said that a refusal to comply with a vaccination direction may result in termination regardless of an employee's reason for refusal, including whether the reason for refusal was for medical reasons, on religious grounds, or being a conscientious objector. Again, the duties of the employee and the nature of the workplace were really relevant here. As I said, this was an aged care home um, case, also an aged care employer, and the employee provided care to elderly people by going into their homes to care for them. The third of our four cases goes back to childcare. And in this case, and the, the final case that I'll deal with, the Commission did in fact decide the question of whether or not the employer's a decision to require employees to have a vaccination as a mandatory condition of their ongoing employment was lawful or reasonable. And in both of these cases, the commission found that it was, and they upheld the dismissal of the employees um, in both of these decisions. In this first case, this, another, this other childcare case, um, it was found again, um, because of the context and the, the nature of the employment of the employer's business that the, um, the mandatory policy was reasonable. In the final case, the decision turned uh, more on the fact that the New South Wales government had recently uh, put out a public health order saying that no person could enter an aged care facility without a flu vaccination. And the commission said, given that 
um, concrete, undeniable public health order, the employer was um, entitled and had a valid reason for dismissing an employee who worked as a receptionist, but nonetheless in the aged care facility, they were entitled to dismiss her for refusing to have a flu vaccine because it meant the public health order was enlivened and she was not able to attend for work. So what can we learn from these four flu cases? We can learn that policies requiring employees to receive a vaccination are not unusual and they're not radical. These sorts of policies exist, particularly in industries where employees are required to give face-to-face, -face, personal, close contact care to vulnerable members of our community. We can also learn that when the duties of the employee and the nature of the workplace are such that it's reasonable for an employee to receive a vaccination in order to perform their duties safely and without risk to others, and in order to allow the employer to discharge their health and safety obligations, then all other things being equal, the commission will uphold the dismissal of an employee who refuses to comply with a direction to get a vaccination. And this correlates with our own experience here at Kingston Reed. Just this month, we assisted a client who had operational employees in the healthcare industry to dismiss several of their employees for refusing to get a flu vaccination. So this is something that is happening in employment, in workplaces um, at the moment. So, so don't think it's unusual or radical or cutting edge to take that approach, certainly in relation to the flu vaccine. So now let's apply the test of lawful and reasonable direction, which we, as we know is the test, coloured as we know it to be by these four cases to the question at hand. When will a direction by you as employers to your employees to get a vaccination for COVID-19 be a lawful and reasonable direction such that if an employee refuses to comply with it, you will have good grounds to take disciplinary action in relation to that employee. As I said, the answer to this requires balancing up those factors which tend to support an argument that the direction is reasonable against those which tend to support an argument that it is unreasonable. So let's go through those factors now. We'll see where we end up on the scales. These are the factors that come to our mind when considering arguing that a direction to have a COVID-19 vaccination is reasonable. As I mentioned, the starting point here is the duty of both employers and employees under the OSH Act to do what is reasonably practicable to keep their employees and themselves safe at work and to keep other people such as clients safe in the workplace too. Feeding into the discharge of those occupational safety and health obligations is the nature of the duties of the employee, that is, the inherent requirements of their role. The question a court or tribunal would ask here is, are the inherent requirements of the employee's role such that them having a COVID-19 vaccination is necessary in order to keep them and other people safe at work. Clearly the answer will vary depending on the precise nature of the role of the employee in question. And it will also vary depending on the nature of the workplace. For example, an IT consultant who can do all of his or her job at home or anywhere else on any computer with an internet connection, is it strictly necessary for that person to have a COVID-19 vaccination so that they don't catch COVID at work? Possibly not. They can perform their duties, it seems, entirely away from other people and away from the designated workplace. But that is not the case, I imagine, for many, if not all of the employers listening to this call. Your operational employees may have as the inherent requirements of their role, being in extremely close physical proximity to your clients, certainly face-to-face -face for prolonged periods of time. 
It may involve being exposed to biological hazards as part of this work. It may also require your employees to be exposed to people for whom catching COVID is more likely to be fatal and who may not themselves be vaccinated for that reason. I would argue that employees in these roles and in these workplaces performing these sorts of duties absolutely must have a COVID-19 vaccination in order for them to be safe from COVID at work and to keep their co-workers and clients safe too. And that's necessary to allow you as employers to discharge your obligations under the OSH Act. You could then add to that argument that a vaccine direction is reasonable based on the employer's approach to workplace health and safety generally, and the wording contained in the applicable workplace policies and procedures. If the workplace is one which already takes its duties regarding workplace health and safety extremely seriously, and this is clear from your existing policies and procedures, and perhaps even your contracts of employment oblige employees to take care of their own health and safety at work and that of their co-workers, all of these matters would lend support to an argument that a direction for those employees to receive the COVID-19 vaccination is reasonable. You could also then add to this statements from federal and state governments although I think they've been a little bit unhelpful in that regard, they nonetheless do encourage people um, where possible to be vaccinated. So that adds to this side of the scales. Um, and there are also matters um, that I think exist right now on this call, uh, for, for employers on this call, um, in terms of operational employees, as I, have, um, as I have explained, but perhaps also administrative employees to the extent that they need to attend work as part of their role. Finally, you could add to um, the, um, this side of the, of the scales, if you will, um, the ramifications of a COVID-19 outbreak in Western Australia. And if you were to give your employees time off work to be vaccinated, and of course the vaccinations are free, uh, while these last two points are small, if you were able to tick those off and say, well, we've given our employees time off work to get this vaccination and it didn't cost them any money, those are points which would tend in favour of a conclusion that a direction to get a vaccination for COVID-19 is reasonable. But the big question is, do all of these factors weigh more than all of the factors which point towards a conclusion that a vaccination direction is unreasonable? And Norman, I'm, I'm hoping really that you will lend us your wisdom to answer some of these questions because these are um, points that have occurred to us about arguments an employee might make to say, um, oh no, your direction is unreasonable and I, I shan't comply with it. And, and I'll go through sort of the beginning of those, but I'd love to sort of hand over to you as I go and to get your input from a scientific and medical perspective and also a factual perspective to help us sort out the truth about some of these issues, um, if, it's, if you don't mind. Um, so, but to begin with, we're weighing up these factors here and you'll see here, on this test tube, um, which my colleague Paige designed beautifully, you'll see that this test tube is more full than my other test tube. And that's because we think that at the moment, probably at the moment in Western Australia, the weight of the factors tending towards a direction being unreasonable are perhaps weightier than those which tend towards a direction being reasonable. And here's a few of the reasons that occur to us. And Norman, I'll hand over to you in a second for your input. But as we know, it doesn't seem that easy to get a vaccine right now, a vaccination right now. And it's the employees working in the industries involved in this call that seem to be most affected by this. Um, there are disturbingly low numbers of employees in the disability services industry, for example, who seem to have been able to access the vaccination. The problems caused by the lack, apparently, of a availability of a vaccine um, have been compounded by the occurrence of what everyone hoped wouldn't happen, which was the development of what seems to be an, an actual risk with the AstraZeneca vaccine. And as we now know, it's no longer recommended for people under 50. And that seems to be an issue with the vaccines that goes beyond the usual fear which a standard anti-vaxxer might have. Um, so it seems to me then that the situation, and this is just the first of my points, but it seems to me the situation right now is that perhaps it's not so easy to get a vaccine 
And there are reasonable reasons for being concerned that the vaccines may not be reliably safe. And if those matters were true, then that would certainly tend towards an argument that a direction by an employer to get a vaccine right now or else face disciplinary consequences is unreasonable. Norman, what might your views be on the, the status of the availability of the vaccines and, and the risks that people in the industries who are on this call might think exist in relation to them getting a vaccine right now? It's going to be a changing story. So let's talk about lack of availability of the vaccines. So if you were in New South Wales at the moment, um, frontline workers, particularly in aged care, are eligible regardless of their age for Pfizer. And they're getting Pfizer. Not only are they getting Pfizer, but their family members are getting Pfizer. Um, and, and it's relatively easy. So if you're between 40 and 50 at the moment without any front, uh, being, uh, in any frontline work situation, um, you'll get an appointment for a Pfizer vaccine next week or the week after. So there's no shortage of Pfizer for the under 50s at the moment within a certain age group. I appreciate in aged care in particular, your categories are older. Um, so you are interlocked here with uh, state policy. Now, West Australia has been slow and clunky with this and not as flexible as New South Wales. So New South Wales has declared they want to have as many of their five or six million population immunized by the end of the year and are going health for leather. And so that's, so there is a lobbying opportunity here, advocacy opportunity here to the state government to say, you know, we have frontline workers in high risk situations who need to be immunized. We insist on being immunized against flu, but your policies don't allow them to be immunized in a safe way to, that's reasonable. Um, so, I mean, I, my belief is that people in that situ this situation, um, which is almost all the people on the call, is that they, they should be getting Pfizer for two reasons. One is that it's quick, so it's three weeks rather than three months. And the other reason is, particularly when you're insisting, and I do believe that you should be insisting that people get immunized um, in the same way as you do the flu, um, is that Pfizer does not have this risk of, uh, of clots. So I think Astra does create an issue, a moral, ethical, and a moral and ethical issue here. So the risk of clots is vanishingly small, but it, it's real. It's between one in 50 and one in 100,000. It's not as serious as was originally thought. There's been one death in Australia so far, and that's a complicated story, and it's not entirely clear what went on. But it's not the 25 to 50% 50, 50 mortality, 40% mortality that you saw overseas. We're getting better at treating it and detecting it early. So it's not as scary as it actually was. But nonetheless, um, you know, and by the way, there are side effects of the influenza vaccine. We tend to accept the influenza vaccine, but you can get Guillain-Barre syndrome, you can get low blood platelets, you can get all sorts of things um, which aren't that serious and aren't deal breakers in terms of the flu vaccine. But we insist on the flu vaccine when there are known side effects. Um, so here you have a known side effect. So it's a difficult issue, but they are, it, it is well known and it's about perception. So the way through this is actually for the West Australian government to walk the talk, which it has not been doing so far, and to make Pfizer available to frontline workers in the industries that were represented by this call. Then I think that the, for the, in terms of the first two, those disappear as issues mm. because you cannot, um, uh, you cannot, um, uh, you know, you, you, those would be the, to me, th those are two other are the deal breakers. Yes. I, don't know whether, I don't know, Helen, whether you want me to go down to the third dot point or you want to just move down those to yourself and I'll come back in. Yes, and I, what, I think let's go down the dot points, like indeed, and, I, I, and certainly in relation to the flu vaccine, um, the cases are clear that if you have a medical condition, and I think that public health order from New South Wales, in fact, enumerated the precise medical conditions that would mean you didn't have to have a flu shot. And I think you've mentioned a couple of those here. What sort of medical conditions would, in your view, Norman, mean that an employer should not dismiss an employee for not getting the vaccine? There's only one. There's only one, and that's anaphylaxis. Okay. So, and the, but even anaphylaxis is not a, is not considered a contraindication to the vaccine. You just got to be watched closely after the vaccine. 
but it would be a sort of iffy one in terms of you know a court case if you were anaphylactic and chose not to have it there, you know there's a well recognized but extremely rare chance of getting an anaphylactic reaction to the Pfizer vaccine a little bit less with Astra mm -hmm. but there's no other medical condition mm -hmm. contraindication in fact most medical conditions are a reason to have it rather than to not have it mm. so let's say you've got an autoimmune disease well there's an imperative to have a vaccine because you're at risk let's say mm. you've got chronic respiratory syndrome then you should get it let's say you've had blood clots in the past you should also get it because your risk of clots with COVID are very high um, and your risk of the clotting syndrome is not increased mm -hmm. so the, the um so i can't think of a, of a of a situation if you have had an organ transplant, absolute imperative to have probably three doses of the vaccine, not just two. Um, so I find it hard to find a medical condition which would be an excuse. Maybe past Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is a, an ascending paralysis, which you can get, which is temporary, which is a contraindication to the flu vaccine, maybe a contraindication to COVID, that might be one, mm. but I'm really struggling to find any other. Okay, helpful. That's very helpful. The next two points I thought we could deal with together, um, because it seemed to me if I was an employee um, and perhaps you know didn't want to get the vaccination, I, I might say, well, does the vaccination even prevent me from giving COVID to the elderly people who I give care for? And does it even prevent me from passing it along to my co-workers? Perhaps does it just mean that I will just get a slightly less severe dose of COVID myself or a severe reaction to COVID myself. But if it doesn't stop me from infecting people at my workplace and infecting the elderly or the disabled or the children who I care for, why should my employer make me have it? It doesn't seem to have a lot of benefit in the workplace. What might be an argument along those lines? So there's no solid data on this and there's you know, incontrovertible data is that um, with the Pfizer vaccine, right about 10 days, and with the Astra one, but also some evidence with, you know, between 10 and 20 days after the vaccine, both Astra and Pfizer, after the first dose, you reduce your chances of spreading the infection by about the same as wearing a mask. So it's about a 60 or 70% mm -hmm. reduction of passing it on. So by that, by that I mean, is that you are 60 to 70% after the first dose, about 12 days afterwards, less likely to get any infection at all, whether symptomatic or asymptomatic, which means that you're 60 or 70% less likely to pass on to somebody else. After the second dose, with Pfizer, that goes up to maybe 85%, and with Astra, maybe it's not that absolutely clear, but probably 70, 75%. So you are actually reduced, let's say you had a COVID outbreak, you would be insisting on wearing masks, and you would be within your rights of dismissing somebody for not wearing a mask at work. So if you're in your rights to doing that, then the vaccine's the same. It's the same reduction in transmitting risk. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of protecting your duty of care as an employer, then you are reducing, also reducing significantly the risks of any symptomatic infection. With the Pfizer vaccine up to 95%, and with the Astra vaccine 12 weeks apart, about 85%. And then your chances of severe disease by nearly 100%. And remember, in these environments, you are working closely with people. You don't have ventilation that's fit for purpose. And you are likely, likely to get high doses of infection. Mm. So this is not just, uh, you know, you're in a restaurant for 10 minutes and you catch a small dose. This is, if somebody gets it in your environment, it's going to be high dose transmission, which means the likelihood of severity is greater. Mm. So there is no question about the dot points four and five. The data are solid and okay. will survive a court case. Okay, so we can cross those ones off the list. This is this is really fascinating. This is such a helpful discussion. Um, it occurred to me then, continuing in the, with the, more of the arguments that we thought might tend towards a conclusion that a direction is unreasonable, that the government, neither state nor federal, has come out and said these vaccinations are mandatory. And they have done that for the flu and they've done that um, 
in no uncertain terms in the flu that that one of the cases the Kimber case I mentioned turned on that point but um, I know other um, state governments have made similar directives in the relation in relation to the flu why hasn't that happened here is it just political political fear um, or is there some other reason perhaps why we haven't seen a government or other institutional directives the incompetence of the government at the federal level and their advisors knows no deaths. Um, so you, they are getting incompetent advice mm -hmm. in an election year with a conservative government and they don't want to be telling people what to do. So I think that in some states they are moving towards insisting in some mm -hmm. jurisdictions that you get, COVID, cover, you get covered with COVID. And let me tell you, as soon as we have a significant outbreak, they're all going to be scrambling to this belatedly. Um, so you probably are going to have to rely on case law here, but there's what what the state government is obliged to do is offer Pfizer to frontline workers in high risk situations, such as the people on this call, particularly, and 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 allow that to be done and relax that process and follow the mm. New South Wales example. So. Mm. If, and that removes that barrier to number two, which I think is a really mm. problematic one. It's very mm. hard, hard for an employer to say, well, I'm going to sack you, but the only option for you because you're over 50 is Astra, um, you know, knowing that, that you could be sending them highly unlikely you know, to getting a problem. The other issue here is time frame. is um, flu vaccine is, is available. Um, Astra is available. You, don't, you just need to turn up to get it now. But Pfizer isn't. So the question is, um, over what time frame is it reasonable to expect somebody to be immunized? Mm. So it may be that this discussion is, well, um, 1A, 1B, all category one workers, even though you don't necessarily all fit in within that. You, you, you mentioned the person who's the IT you know, manager working from home, but frontline workers are at the front of the line, um, a high percentage have been covered. Then at that point, it's reasonable to mandate it in your workplace. And to, to create the expectation is, the expectation is that you will be covered, but we're not going to implement you know, the hard line on this until maybe September. Mm. You know, so in other words, what would be reasonable would be not an immediate process. And that also allows for a bit of hesitancy from some people who say, I just want to wait and see how all this pans out. Mm. And can I get it? So I think there's a time frame here. Mm. If, if the Commonwealth is not, how can you sack an employee when the federal government does not have a vaccine policy, which actually has Australia immunized until early 2023. I'm not, sure, I'm not sure how a court is going to view that. Well, um, my view on how a court is going to view that is from a practical perspective. And I think that is why this test tube is more full than the other test tube, because you've knocked out all of these other reasons. You know, you've said that the Pfizer vaccine is as effective as a mask, but obviously you can't knock the Pfizer vaccine off yourself or forget to put it on. So it's better than a mask. Um, the, the low likelihood of chancing of contracting COVID in the West Australian community is something, but it's certainly not determinative. Oh, and oh, the lack oh, of sorry, just on that. Mm. So people within the last six months have been sacked in Good Start and elsewhere for not accepting the flu vaccine. There have been 232 cases of flu up to the 5th of May nationally in Australia. And by the end of March in, in, in um, Western Australia, I think there have been two cases. So we are sacking people for not taking flu vaccine when there's almost no flu around. So not having COVID around is not an answer. Mm -hmm. Mm, yeah, good. Okay, so really, you've crossed out everything apart from those first two and identified, thankfully, as we did, that those first two were insurmountable from a legal perspective at the moment in terms of requiring employees to be vaccinated right now or else lose your job right now. 
And I think that ties into the comment you just made about how can an employer dismiss their employees for not having a vaccination when the federal government's rollout program isn't due to be complete until I think you said early 2022. And early I think of 2023. Oh, oh, even worse. Well, so I think in that context, the court would look at the practical reality and ability of the employee who's before them to go out and get the safe vaccine that they need now. Un unless they're in a high priority group. And most people in, on this call will be employing people in high priority groups. So that'll be that'll be the yin and yang of this in, in mm -hmm. terms of how this swings. But what what's needed is the, is this um, is this sector to lobby the West Australian government to make Pfizer available to frontline workers in a timely way, and that by say the end of August, anybody in this sector who's who's uh, eligible by the cat by this category has been able to have mm. it, mm. and on the first of September, you can start triggering these sorts of processes. I, I completely agree with you. I think that's exactly, exactly right. Um, and I liked that you said at the beginning, you know, that this was a, a moving feast because for exactly the reasons you've just said, those first two points seem today to be insurmountable, but they shouldn't be. And hopefully soon they, um, the vaccines are available and the sorts of vaccines that the frontline workers need, as you say, such that perhaps this year, employers can turn their minds to requiring employees to be vaccinated and that if that needed to be tested in court, it would be found to be a lawful and reasonable direction because the vaccine is readily available to these frontline workers and it's the sort of vaccine that they need. There is another wild card, which should be another drop point here for the future, okay. which is variants. Ugh. I had this to talk to you, efficacy of the vaccine in relation to new strains. I think that's probably was my, way of saying variants. Talk to us about the quagmire of variants. Um, so it's, if you, what's scaring people at the moment is the outbreak in Singapore. So there's been an outbreak, so Singapore has gone into a partial lockdown last weekend. Many mm -hmm. of the reason is two or three outbreaks, but the one that really spooked them was in Shangi Airport. And it's the Indian variant. It's the Indian variant spreading around the world. That's the 617. And um, it looks as though it's more contagious than the British variant. So to give you an idea here, some of you might remember from the beginning of the pandemic, we used to talk about the reproduction number, the R0. And that's, if, if in an uncontrolled environment, you're infected with COVID, what, how many people would you spread it to on average? So the ancestral virus, the Wuhan virus, uh, was about 2.3 or 2.4 people. The 117, which is the Kent variant or called the UK variant, is around 4.5. So you can see the difference. I, if, if I had the Wuhan, I'd spread it to two, or three, two and a half people. If I've got the British variant, I'm spreading it to nearly five people. The, one one, the, the 617, which is the Indian variant, is up around six, and it may be as high as eight. So you can see how there's a stepwise yeah, for sure. of contagiousness. So that's, that's the first thing. Now, that's an argument for getting immunized, by the way. Strong argument for getting immunized with anything. Um, the, but the worry is that I think it's 11 people in the Shangi airport outbreak, were fully immunized against Pfizer. And they got symptomatic disease. They didn't get seriously ill, they got symptomatic disease. Despite having had the Pfizer vaccine, vaccination. Two doses. Mm -hmm. So the argument that I just ran, which is based on previous variants mm. about not spreading it to others, may become less true as time goes on. Uh -huh. But um, it's still likely that you are going to get a reduction in spread, but the data on which that are based is less clear, are less clear. Mm -hmm. But I still think this would survive as, as, as insisting because um, you are not going to get 
so ill and you're unlikely to be excreting as much virus as somebody who is who is sick and the employer has a duty of care and I don't think can sign away that duty of care just because somebody said well I I don't fancy getting sick I don't mind getting sick I'm okay hmm. no and, you can't um, therefore your duty of care supervenes um, mm -hmm. you, you know you don't want to wear a helmet on site well you don't get on site on the building works I don't care that you don't like wearing a helmet I've got a duty of care so no helmet no work and this is the same thing that you're wearing a helmet because I don't want you to get a brain injury by working on this site mm -hmm. and I don't want you to get serious COVID-19 by not being immunized so the duty of care will win out there because these vaccines will cover against severe disease. Mm. I think you're exactly right and surely also a court would have an appreciation of the fact that this is a novel disease and a, and a novel pandemic that we're in and the science is developing and just because we don't have vaccines for all of the future incarnations of the virus doesn't negate the fact that the vaccines we have are effective at doing what we know they need to do right now and if the science changes in the future and now we need to have the such and such other vaccine in three years time to fix those variants will say la vie but, but i don't think that negates the lawfulness and reasonableness to have the vaccine right now so there is another argument that can go into the reasonableness uh, one mm. is that i just i just um said you know the, the, the r naught is 2.4 and 6. that assumes something like influenza which is much more evenly spread in the community this is not influenza and this virus spreads in clusters. So it's a cluster based thing. So if you take some of you might remember, well, there's a paraphil cluster in South Australia, and then there was the Southwestern Sydney, the Crossroads Motel outbreak last year. The R naught there was actually in both those, one was about 35 and the other one was about 15 because they're clusters. One person spread to a lot of people. In, on almost everybody in this call, you are talking about high risk cluster environments. So in terms of the public health, each one of the environments of people who are on this call is a potential super spreading environment. Mm. And therefore you have an imperative for the public health is, is that it's not just you know, the, the, the explosion that's possible with um, in each of your environments is huge. So it's not just saying to you know, you know, if you're getting the police and ambulance protected, that's really protecting them more than protecting the general public. Mm. And your situation is it's a public health measure to prevent a major outbreak. Mm. Because in each one of those environments, if it gets out, it's a major cluster. Mm. Yeah, that makes that makes sense. Well, it seems then weighing up those those two um test tubes of virus as it were um there's even more now that's adding to the to the reasonableness one and a lot that's being taken away from the unreasonable one and i think the um the points you've raised about um the imperative of the vaccine particularly in the context of the sorts of employers who are on this call is really crucial in terms of once the those first two dot points become eradicated and we have the availability of the vaccine we need um, to to make this a fairly um fairly likely to be a reasonable direction given by the sorts of employers on this call to their frontline operational employees and hopefully that gives people um some comfort and some um yeah, some feeling of confidence about what the future holds in a, in a COVID-19 vaccination context. And to put it in contrast, if we were talking in New South Wales, it would be reasonable pretty much right now. Uh -huh. Pretty much right now. Yeah, which is so useful to hear you say those words out loud. It's certainly what we've been thinking here and what we've been advising our clients, but it does run a little in the face of, um, certainly at least what the government is saying, which is it can't be made mandatory. And um, the um, regulators here in the employment law space, the Fair Work Ombudsman and Safe Work Australia have each come out, I don't have the quotes in front of me, but saying it's unlikely 
you know, that it would be able to be made mandatory and, and those sorts of unhelpful comments, which we don't agree with um, in terms of a, a conclusion of an employment law principle. So it's, it's great it's to have had this complete discussion. It is complete neocon bullshit with no public health evidence behind it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The general community, yeah, but the general community, it's very hard to say you're mandating a, a vaccine. Mm. But we do that for children going to school. Well, we do. That's right. You're exactly right. And we do it, um, you know, in other industries for the flu already. Um, and it's just getting us, getting our minds, I suppose, over the novelty of COVID and the scare factor, scaremongering around COVID to realise that we're in, you know, not unsafe territory. If the government had procured properly and we had plenty of Pfizer, we would not be having this discussion. It's dominated by the fear of Astra. Mm, mm. Ellen, I'm conscious of time and I thought yes. maybe you've got one more slide to go I'll round through. that out. And then there's a couple of questions online and we might give others the opportunity to ask as well, if that's okay. Please, yes, of course. No, thank you for that. So look, yes, the final slide, which I think ties in beautifully, I hope, to, to the discussion and the you know immense help we've just received here from Norman, which is people, you know, once you finish off this call, to go back and consider your businesses and consider your approach. Do your OSH Act obligations and your operational requirements need, mean that you need to think about, and I think Norman would say the answer is yes, um, being in a position to direct your frontline operational employees to get vaccinated. Once you've decided that you may be in this space and that it is likely to be a direction that you are required to take under law, but that you want to take in any event, the next step you can do right now is to review your existing contracts and policies and procedures and ensure that those documents lay the groundwork um, for ultimately you being in a position to defend your decision to require employees to be vaccinated. Your policies need to already be saying, safety is our number one focus. You as an employee must do all things necessary to ensure your health and safety at work and that of your co-workers. And that will allow um, legal arguments to flow from the existence of those contractual rights and obligations to ultimately defend you, defend your position if this were to become tested at court. And once you've checked your policies and contracts to ensure they have that necessary wording and those necessary obligations, consider what your vaccination policy itself might look like, because you're going to need a new policy that obliges employees to comply with this direction. Communication will be key here, and your policy will need to be fair and reasonable and have some flexibility um, but it will nonetheless need to be consistent and direct and clear. Finally, always prudent, but I think particularly in this situation to get legal advice on your existing contracts and policies, on the wording of your new vaccination policy, and certainly before you go taking any disciplinary action in relation to an employee for refusing to get a COVID-19 vaccination in the face of a direction to do so. As we've seen from just those four cases in a relatively short period of time in the flu context, this field is ripe for um, claims of unfair dismissal, adverse action and disability discrimination. Um, and I think the publicity which would flow from those sorts of cases would be significant. So get your ducks in a row now in terms of your contracts and your policies and procedures, um, and that should put you in as best position possible to start um, implementing that, that directive um, in the future. As Norman says, once the state government gets its house in order and we um, have the availability of the vaccine to frontline employees in this industry that we need. So that rounds me out. Perhaps back to you, John. Great, thanks. Uh, thanks, Helen, and thanks, Norman. Some fantastic discussion there. Perhaps if you can just stop sharing the screen now and then we'll be able to more easily see people. Um, and at this point, we might just go to the question. So Louise from Wacos and I are just going to sort of co, um, you know, facilitate those questions. And if we go back up the, um, the line of the chat, um, and I think we'll just go through them chronologically and just a brief comment from one or both of you on those, if you can. So Tanya has asked, what happens if an employee becomes unwell from the vaccine that is mandated by an employee? Uh, mandated 
by an employer, I guess that means. Uh, I might come back first of all. So what, one of the things you have to do if you're going to go through this is expect to have uh, some absenteeism on the day or two after the vaccine. So Pfizer first dose, okay. Uh, second dose, people can get quite ill for a couple of days. And what they've noticed overseas is particularly a, a shortfall in rostering. You've got a rostering problem sometimes after that. So you've just got to plan for that. I don't know what the legal implication is. Certainly um, a person who is um, ill or injured, be it from a vaccination or otherwise is entitled to use their personal leave for um, taking time away from work to recover from that illness or injury. So you, you're certainly right, they would need to be entitled to, and they of course would be entitled to access their personal leave entitlements. If they didn't have paid personal leave entitlements, perhaps because they were a casual employee or they'd exhausted that, um, it would be prudent for an employer to think about giving um, employees access to unpaid personal leave, or perhaps even paid if they wanted to do so. They may have as part of their policy, everyone's entitled to two days extra paid personal leave in order to recover from any effects of the vaccine. Um, but if you weren't minded to introduce that sort of a policy, um, certainly it would be reasonable to allow employees to take unpaid personal leave um, in those circumstances. I'd have to have a think about any workers' compensation liability which might accrue um, from perhaps, you know, um, not just, you know, a one or two days, you know, feeling unwell, but if some dreadful thing were to happen as a result of the vaccination, you know, your arm were to drop off or something, I wonder if... Um, there could be an ability there to enliven some workers' compensation um, obligations. I'd, I'd have to check that one out. John, hi, I'm Louise. I, I, if you want, we can take it in turns. I can read from the bottom of the list and you read from the top, and I'm sure we'll join up. There you go. Good. <laughs> so if it, is it legal to offer a financial incentive to get immunised? So you've just spoken about personal leave, which is great. But to, is it legal to give financial incentives to employees? Pay them. I don't see why not. I don't. I can't see why it would be unlawful. Um, I think we have certainly recommended to clients that you give employees a period of time, you know, a few hours or half a day to go and get the vaccine on work time, which I suppose is a is a sort of um, financial incentive because you don't have to work um, and you get a little bit of free time off. I haven't come across anybody exploring the possibility of, you know, you're sort of thinking of a cash bonus or something like that. Is that kind of what you're thinking of? I don't see why. That might be interesting from a, a publicity perspective, I suppose, but I don't think it's unlawful. Um, it's, you know, yeah, certainly not unlawful. And question there about the um, extending to other vaccines, you know, um, uh, to pregnant women about measles, rubella, et cetera. Do you think there'd be a possibility at some stage of a requirement for those vaccines to also be mandatory? It depends again on the application of the test of lawful and reasonable and the inherent requirements of that woman's role and the workplace in which she works and the likelihood of the prevalence of, spe of spreading measles, mumps and rubella um, and the ramifications of the people to whom she spread it suffering from measles, mumps and rubella. Um, so perhaps that's, that dovetails into a medical question. I suppose what springs to mind is we haven't had mandatory vaccination directions for those sorts of viruses yet. We do have them for children, which I suppose is a reflection of the ability of children to spread them easily because of their bad hygiene and to perhaps to suffer badly from them themselves. And perhaps the view is, and maybe this feeds to Norman, adults are able usually to contain those sorts of viruses enough with practices with you know hand washing and those sorts of practices that it's not critical that people are vaccinated um, but i suppose as well perhaps many are vaccinated as children and so that falls away we're talking here in the context of covid about a vaccine that nobody has and certainly nobody had a year ago um, and perhaps there's a herd immunity issue to throw out a medical term um, that springs to mind with measles mumps and rubella and those more commonly vaccinated diseases which means a direction for a person who doesn't have that vaccination now to get it may not be lawful and reasonable because it's not so necessary as COVID is. Norman. Yeah, I think there's, um, in childcare, there's probably an issue around 
you know, some child care centers who take very young babies, that the staff need to be cocooned and be fully immunized to mm -hmm. the young babies. What the evidence around that is sort of fairly loose. Certainly having children immunized, there's no question because they're vulnerable and you do not want to get rid of these infections. I think unless something is running at and spreading in the community and you're worried about it, like say a rubella outbreak or something like that, I think it's going to be tough. It's, it's when you're talking about epidemic. So, and that's to really what I'm defining out there is non-seasonal outbreaks. This is an epidemic situation, which is flu, you get seasonal epidemics and we've got a pandemic situation with COVID. That's very mm. different when you've got the general community affected. Mm. I think, and that's, that's an excellent point. I mean, we have to remember that COVID has shut down the entire world and it has serious health ramifications, but also ramifications that are broader from a, a business and the functioning of the world perspective, which measles, mumps, rubella doesn't have. Okay. Thank you. There's the next question. I, um, I think you'll be able to answer this. Can an existing by hazard policy and procedure be adjusted to include COVID-19 vaccination in line with the requirements of the flu vaccination for nominated roles? So Certainly. Just... Certainly. Policies and procedures, um, absent some sort of um, unusual guarantee in your policies that say we will never, ever change these no matter what, um, employers are perfectly free and able to amend their policies communicate those new policies, roll them out, give employees time to understand the new policies, time to ask questions. Um, and then once the policies have been rolled out and communicated, employers can hang their hats on them and say, well, this is what the new policy says. And so this is what you have to do. So the answer is, yeah, absent some odd promise to the contrary, um, that's fine. Thanks for Philippa's comment about Aspen starting to roll out um, Pfizer in the next couple of weeks. So uh, that's one to keep an eye out for. Presumably, Philippa, that's in Western Australia um, you're talking about. Um, yes, it is. Right, right. Um, NDIS requires us to provide services from vaccinated work workers if that is the request of the customer services. Um, uh -huh. Are there risks for employers um, uh, require request staff to advise us of their vaccine status. So do, do they have to advise what their status is? I think, Justin, is that what you're asking? Because then we have to keep records clearly about yeah, that. The, yeah, thanks, John. The, the, the question is whether or not there's legal peril around the medical, you know, disclosure of medical um, information requiring it. Mm -hmm. If we need to provide continuity of service, mm -hmm. we need to know that the work is vaccinated. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. That makes sense. And that's really good to know that the NDIS has that requirement. Um, the answer is that subject to your compliance with your obligations under the Privacy Act, that is fine. If you are going to have a, um, a direction to employees that they need to be vaccinated, then um, I imagine as part of a good policy, it would say, and you will need to provide us with proof of when this is done. And you'd get, a, I imagine, maybe a certificate or a stamp or something to indicate that you've been vaccinated. Um, and then employers would keep those medical records on the employee's personnel file in the same way as they would keep and handle any other medical records in relation to their employees. Um, under the Privacy Act, medical records are sensitive information, so they attract a greater degree of protection. However, um, employers are excused from the obligations contained in the Privacy Act that are built into the Australian privacy principles in relation to employment records that are held about current employees which is not to say that you can go spreading those, or those, um, that sensitive information around just because you're exempt from the Australian privacy principles. You must still handle the sensitive information in accordance with the way an employee would reasonably expect you to deal with that. So, of course, you're disclosing it to the customer. Well, indeed, and yes, and I think that that is right. So what you might put in your COVID vaccination policy is you will need to provide us with evidence that you've been vaccinated in a form that is acceptable to us. And you understand that we may need to disclose this to our clients and perhaps other categories um, as part of the performance of our services and in accordance with our obligations under our NDIS uh, you know, um, certification arrangements. And then the employee, and you consent to this um, employee, and then you're fine. 
Um, and certainly you would need to disclose it in a way that was careful and sensitive and still confidential and we wouldn't broadcast it on your Facebook page. Um, but yes, um, subject to your compliance with the Privacy Act, um, that is fine. Thanks, Helen. That was some really helpful. And this is a question specifically to Dr Norman Swan from Sheila. Um, what are the politics behind the government choosing the preferred Astra AstraZeneca over Pfizer? What is the cost or ability to manufacture this in Australia? Um, the, story with, the story with this is that the Commonwealth government is not good at procuring. Just think of Collins class submarines. They're, that's not their core business. Their core business is policy, taxation, Yes, they run the defense forces and border controls, but they don't run anything in health. They don't even run general practice. They fund stuff in the policy. And they've got good, you know, they do, you know, got good expertise in policy. So they don't run anything and they're not good at procurement. Now, what happened was that in June, Pfizer approached the government and said, how much do you want? When do you want it? Because Pfizer wanted Australia to be kind of a, an example to the world of implementing the Pfizer vaccine when it was approved. And essentially, um, Somebody went in to that meeting who was not experienced at procurement and treated Pfizer like dirt. I've now heard this from three different sources. And they said, oh, we're not even going to think about you until you give us all your data and show us your manufacturing processes and so on, which is an unreasonable request because, you know, it hadn't even been through the Food and Drug Administration and anyway, the Threat of Goods Administration would get that for approval anyway. And then they sent in the bean counters to try and nickel and dime them on the, on the cost. And so they lost the opportunity to get Pfizer. And in any event, they only ordered 10 million at the end of the year when they should have ordered 50 million as a full backup to the community. So it's actually incompetence rather than political engineering here. They were just incompetent at procurement. And, um, and they, you know, they thought UQ was gonna be okay. They thought Pfizer, they, at that point, you know, were thinking about Astra being manufactured locally, but. Um, and Astra was cheap, so there was a bit of nickel and diming going on. I suspect that this poor national advice that you've heard about, uh, there were one or two people there who didn't think the mRNA vaccines were going to amount to anything, even though by that stage it was quite clear they were pretty special. Um, you know, if, if you want a conspiracy, you know, you've got, you've got something that's gone wrong and you think conspiracy theory versus incompetence, go for incompetence every time, because that's, what, that's what's happened here. But now it's an election year, they're covering it up. Okay, a couple of other comments there from um, Felicity saying that, uh, um, you know, that nurses and uh, others um, at Prevention of Healthcare staff have received communication with log on details to book appointments for the Department of Health. Um, so that's progressing, which is good. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Anne White, um, issue of individual persons concerned with AstraZeneca are real. They may prefer the Pfizer vaccine, but if they're aged over 50, that could be problematical. Um, uh, could that lead to uh, views of employer aiding in age discrimination? I think one of the challenges there is to get the Pfizer vaccine out more broadly, as, um, as Norman has indicated. Um, At least the time Yes, yes, indeed. Final questions. People want to put up their hand and try and ask something um, rather than typing it out. Is there anything else? Louise, there's another new message down the bottom there. Oh, someone's had AstraZeneca and still alive. That's good. Was that you, Felicity? Thank you. You good too. Year. You too. And, and we saw Norman on TV with uh, Michael uh, Rollins having it down in Melbourne. Yeah. Well, that's 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 here. I'm on a wait list. <laughs> yep, yep, I'm having mine Sunday. Nikki's had hers, so that's good. Um, great. Louise, over to you for some final closing comments. Yeah, firstly, a huge thank you to Helen and to, to Norman for putting on this webinar for the community service sector here in Western Australia. Um, COVID's been one hell of a ride for the community service providers, I'm sure right across the country, but in particular here in Western Australia, we've struggled a bit, especially at the very beginning. Um, 
I firmly believe the community service providers actually saved lives. They didn't stop services. So when we're talking about frontline services for disabilities, aged care, homelessness, youth at risk, women's refuges, had no PPE, but they didn't stop their services. And it was under a huge risk. And I think that actually continues today. Um, and there's an absolute keenness from the community service sector to do the right things by their employees, hence this particular webinar that we've run today. Um, but to make sure there's a real desire from the community service sector to make sure our staff are vaccinated and people are well informed. So we're also working with um, the Department of Health to try and get information out to frontline services of how they can support those who are most vulnerable in our community, because we know they're the ones that miss out. So if you think of street present homeless people or people from cold backgrounds, the, art, the information isn't getting through effectively. So that's another piece of work that we're actually trying to do to ensure those who are most vulnerable in our community get the vaccination and they're well informed because it's misinformation, I think, which is going to cause the blockage in this. Norman, I love the way you speak. Or, um, I won't repeat all the words, but you're really to the point and, you know, always lean towards incompetence and a conspiracy theory. I know their staff, when your face was on full screen, they were taking selfies with you. You've become um, a bit of a pop star. <laughs> uh, so thank you for that. And a huge thank you, Helen, as well, of, you know, sticking, out, sticking your neck out. You know, we always know lawyers are quite conservative about the advice they give, just in case. But this has been an information session. So it, it's, you know, the, everything in this particular space is new for us all. It's not black and white. So we can't thank you enough, Helen, as well. John, would you like to add anything else as well? No, it's just to reiterate what you've said, Louise. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thanks to Helen and to Paige for uh, a lot of work put in. Thanks to Simon for recommending Helen as well. Thanks to Norman for, for joining us and coming online and for all of the work that you're doing. Uh, so really appreciate everyone's time. Pleasure. We'll send out the recording and uh, and the slides. So Thank you. au revoir. Thanks again.